Sonic Talk. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Sonic Talk, episode 556, recording today live on Wednesday, the 31st. Ooh, it's Halloween. Damn, I would have put some makeup on or, or, or <laughs> found some cobwebs to show on camera. There aren't actually cobwebs in this. In this, Normally, I would say I just found them in the cupboard. But yeah, happy Halloween, or if you don't... Uh, if you if you're sitting at home uh, at the right time, I guess you'd have to be on the other side of the pond, uh, on the other side of the world, if you were ignoring the doorbell uh, or uh, you know risking having your front door egged or the front gate taken off the hinges. <laughs> if you're that sort of get off my lawn kind of person, it's probably not going to be so much fun for you. But if you've got a little tub of sweets next to the front door, then fill your boots and have a lot of fun. Uh, I'm sure I will. We'll get back. I always. I get. I always tear up because I remember um, we get these tiny little children coming by with their parents who are sort of hanging by the end of the end of the path. It's not like a drive or anything, and they they come up and go a trick or treat, and you just think, okay, go on, <laughs> do your worst. But I don't. I always give them something. But I remember um, for those who perhaps haven't done this, this is just a parenting skill. Letting your kids, small children, out on Halloween, even with your parents, it really increases their confidence because they're out in the dark, which is something very un unusual to them. And I've noticed every year that our daughter got more and more kind of like it really helped step up her confidence. Anyway, so I'm not saying what she needs to do, what your kids need to go is go out and vandalise property <laughs> in return for bribery. But you know, I'm just saying it forms a rich part of the rich tapestry of life. But this isn't a podcast to do with uh, parenting skills or Halloween. This is the music tech podcast, Sonic Talk, which uh, you will hopefully uh, be familiar with, uh, available on sonicstate.com. Uh, if you want to join us, uh, we go on YouTube. Here's the YouTube chat room. Uh, and there's also our friends over on the our own IRC chat room, sonicstate.com forward slash live. Uh, what follows is an hour or so of... Uh, uh, informal chat to do with music technology, all things surrounding synthesizers, software, hardware, uh, new products, all that kind of stuff. Uh, so do stay tuned. And don't forget, uh, we'll be uh, giving away a copy of Isotope's excellent RX-7 audio restoration bundle, uh, which uh, you will find out details about about halfway through the show. So do stay tuned. So we'll say hello to some guests. We've got a new boy in town. Uh, his name is Dominic Hawken. As you can see, he's uh, a musician, electronic musician. Um, man of many talents, Dominic. You've uh, done an awful lot of stuff. I mean, as well as just sort of various business interests. I was reading that you were initially involved in kind of pop scene and you were involved in the E17 stuff, which you yeah. may or may not be uh, now proud of because obviously there are different, there, there have been different personalities linked with the band name that perhaps one wouldn't want to go on holiday with. But this is true. You co-wrote, you co-wrote Stay Another Day. I mean, hats off to you, mate. That is... Thank you. That's a well, retirement a fund, right? I could do with a hat. Yeah, Christmases are good in this house. Um, no, that was that was a moment. I did uh, I did a lot of stuff with E17 from about their second album onwards, co-writing with Tony uh, in the band, and that was great. It was almost like um, the end of that period of my musical career, really. And then I... Um, you go through a bit of a phase of like, what am I going to do next in music? And actually, you know, I'll take a little bit of a break after that because it's it's really downhill from there. Because uh, yeah. I was always into pop. I used to play keyboards for Boy George back in the day originally, and then loads of studio stuff, always always pop based. So I took a break, and then I'm back again now, working more on the app sides, um, just getting back into music a bit, um, you know, a bit more really. So I've got this brilliant studio, which is a lot of the kit I used to have back in the day, which has now become super trendy and very sought after. Um, and some other stuff like the modular and a lot of plugins and so forth. So it's 100% on this now. Wow. Okay. So you must have a lot of stories that you probably can't say on air, <laughs> which I'm looking forward to when we meet in person and you can tell me about. I mean, touring back back then, I mean, A, with Culture Club, Boy George, and, and also E17, who were, you know, obviously young lads on the road, must have been. But did you go out on the road with them or were you just in the studio? <laughs> No, not really. It was in the studio, but but it was at the height of the mayhem, really. So um, it took a while to do the first album, like most bands, and then suddenly it's a success. Uh, and you've got to make the next album in, in a couple of weeks to fit in with the touring schedule. So that moment of of writing was was right at the peak. It was a, it was a real laugh, actually. It was a very hot summer. And we had about two weeks to do 10 songs. We did a song a day. Um, and actually, I mean, yeah, that, that, that's one example. That song was written the day I met Tony Mortimer. Um, we started at 10, 11 in the morning and we were done by about seven in the evening, putting the final vocals on the demo. And a lot of it ended up on the final, a lot of the recordings we did then ended up on the final thing. And the whole song was done. And also wow. it, it's a bit, it's almost like when the pressure's off, when I was doing sessions, I still had to pay my rent. I kind of thought, well, yeah, I've got to do these sessions because I've got to pay money, I've got to buy some new kit or whatever. So that's always in the back of your mind. 
Um, and also with songwriting, I'm not necessarily getting paid for songwriting. It's about writing a song that then sells. Um, so there's always this kind of commercial thing in the back of your head. Um, and that was like kind of relax, chill out, write a song, whatever comes out. And, and what actually came out was some really good stuff. Um, and it took next to no time at all. Whereas you can spend two months on a song going round and round in circles when you should really chuck it out and do the next one. Yeah, no, it sounds very sort of almost Nashville style, that sort of pace. I mean, well, normally, mm. except Nashville, they'd be doing an entire album in a day rather than just one song. But I mean, based on, you know, because our, we've, our backgrounds are similar in terms of coming up through sort of MIDI studios and programming samplers and that kind of detailed level of stuff, sometimes it would just take a very long time because it does take a very long time when you've got the tools that don't promote fast workflow, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I, th I think so. Um, and back then as well, I mean, this is back with Ataris running Cubase, first kind of thing with a layout, with an arranged layout on it. The Atari had a, I don't know, a very small hard drive on it, bunches of samples in Akai. It used to be sponsored by Akai back then as well, so I had a rack full of Akai kit. And I was doing a lot of hip hop work actually back then as well. So it's all about time stretching and tuning samples from DJs to get them in tune with each other. Um, and that's what you do in GarageBand with one button or, or in Ableton with one slide now. And back then I used to have to get a calculator out and work out the percentages to shift everything around. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Or spend, you know, spend a day tuning someone's vocals or whatever because they'd gone off on tour and they couldn't come back and re-sing the BVs or whatever, you know. Um, but you find your own little zone, don't you? You get used to the kit that you've got. I had some of this kit, not massive amounts of it, and we were out there just making the, just making tunes and having fun, really. And I think when you're having fun doing it, rather than getting very anal about everything and trying to make the, I don't know, the frequencies on the on the hi hat exactly right, and spending an hour doing it, you you might as well just stop, just just make a good tune, find the right people to work with as well, um, not just from the point of view of working with E17, find people that can embellish your abilities. You know, so if you're not very good at, at lyrics, work with a lyricist, you know. It's, it always amazes me that way back in the early days of the music industry, you had to be an amazing singer um, uh, because they had to put you in a room with an orchestra and you had to get it right the first time, you know, the Frank Sinatra's of all the world. Um, but they'd never think of Frank Sinatra write, writing a song. And they expect solo artists now to write the songs and to do the performances and to have everything ready for them. When actually, if you put the right people together, um, it works really, really well. So as long as you're aware of your own limitations, um, yeah. and you find people around you to work with. I think yeah, it takes the pressure off. It's a lot less precious as well. Wow, well, there we go. I think we could probably stop the podcast right there. Loads of sage words of advice, and that pretty much sums all of it up. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dom. Um, uh, we've also got Mr. Gaz Williams, who's there in Bristol. Gaz, of course, bass player, uh, music technologist, uh, and... Uh, Guitarist. Keytarist, yeah. I I was gonna. I sadly I couldn't get the keytar clip in time to play it oh. because Gaz has just reviewed the Roland AX <laughs> Edge or Axe Edge, mm. uh, which was an interesting bit of. It was a fun review to do. A uh, lot of oh, talk because it's a it's very conceptually sort of challenging a keytar, as we've discussed before. But we'll you'll get your take on it. Anyway, how are you, Gaz? You yes. well? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Just um, had Lee Kemp over today. We've been having a uh, like a bit of a Volca jam, <laughs> and we've done the we carried out the Volca mod on the on the beats on there. We did the snare mod today, which was something that's been a long, long waiting to do. Which uh, you know, I mean, this is kind of an old story, but it, 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 I think the the story goes something like when the original Volca beats came out, there was some um, there was some copyright thing to do with the uh, to do with the uh, the snare, and it was crippled. Uh, and it, uh, so we've actually, you know, you can put this uh, little um, a capacitor or transistor, I can't remember which, uh, in onto the circuit and it and it restores the snare. And we've just done that today and it absolutely makes an enormous difference, actually. So if you have got a Volca Beats and you haven't done the mod, it's a bit fiddly, the mod, but it's, it's only just putting the one component in there. It's essentially putting back what was originally there. I think they must have taken it out to, to, to make the circuit um, not convene some copyright sort of issue well, what did it uh, sound what is it does it sound more like an 808 or is it or is it has it got it's a, a cr78 snare i think i think that was something or was it definitely sounds like a cr78 snare but it does now following the mod but i have made a little uh, a little recording of it before and after so that's something that i can maybe upload at some point if people are interested to hear Excellent. what a difference it makes but it definitely is worth doing and um yeah uh you know yeah it's 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 it, it's almost night and day really the difference it really makes a huge difference um so we're going to be hearing nice Volca, are we going to be hearing Volker all over your uh, your new tunes <laughs> 
Well, I mean, <laughs> no, is the question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, but I've been setting up these kind of Volker jamming rigs, really, and um, there's two there's two sort of rigs, and um, so that's the reason for that. Um, it's like a two person uh rick and um uh, yeah so uh, yeah uh but yeah yeah definitely worth doing definitely worth doing as, as a mod as i say it's very simple a very simple mod if a little fiddly but um yeah it's just literally just putting the one the one component in there um but uh yeah yeah it's good it's yeah it makes it just it just it makes it sound proper really you didn't realize just quite yeah, how bad quite, quite how crap it sounded yeah there we go. i'll say <laughs> yeah. it if you won't um yeah, yeah but yeah what's one of the first? anyway well let's get on to a bit of news i mean uh, i'm going to start with this guy this is uh, something i've not come across you've before, been working but... on this mix for a while You're so this really is in new the wave zone, sound grid and hardware. what's coming out of your speakers is starting to sound like what you hear in your head you're using all these great tools to make everything fit in just right. Some compression here, a little EQ there, a short delay, a long reverb, add some harmonics, tape saturation. Before you know it, you get clicks, pops, and playback stutter. It's just too much for your computer to handle. You want to be unlimited. Keep the creative flow going and make music, not deal with computer issues, especially if you have a deadline to meet. But before you have a meltdown, check this out. SoundGrid Connect has the freedom fighters you need. Cries for help do not go unheard. SoundGrid Connect allows you... I, I, I'm not sure how much more of that can take. It's a very strange <laughs> ad marketing concept uh, for something which is actually quite niche and, co and, and, and yeah. complex. Uh, this is, of course, the Waves SoundGrid. Uh, SoundGrid may be something that you might have come across uh, if you're a live sound engineer uh, or maybe working in larger studio facilities. It essentially offloads DSP processing of plugins via networked audio. So you get very low latency and it just means there's less of it. I'm not sure I would necessarily say that many people these days unless they're using like an, a 2011 Mac Mini, are running out of DSP power on their regular plugins on most modern computers. But obviously that must be happening, depending if you're working on higher sample rates and stuff like that. But this new news is, uh, let me see, I've got it. Uh, I think I've got a web page here where it is. Where Yeah, what it is, is it's basically a tiny little uh, SandGrid server, which is a mini computer, uh, runs at 849, uh, 0.8 millisecond, and it will give you extra plug-in power that you could just attach via if you've got a a, 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 a SandGrid-enabled hard uh, audio device, which there are a few. I think the cheapest is the DigiGrid stuff, which is about 500 quid for a little cube thing. They're really cute, actually. Uh, I wonder because I'd never come across this, uh, and I wondered whether any of you guys had and what you thought about it. I'll because UA have cornered the market in this, but that's that's in within host a lot of the time. Although you can offload it via the Apollos and whatnot. Do you use any? DSP externally? No, I've always been tempted by the UA stuff. Um, I've got to be honest, I never really suffer from latency with wave stuff. I do use it. I used to use a lot of it. I use less now. And I've sort of moved off to some stuff like FabFilter. Um, I could really do with an offloading box like that, but not so much for waves. Waves would be useful. I probably use, you know, um, more plugins if I if I could offload them, but like you, I don't really get that much trouble. I've got a Mac Pro, <laughs> the, the the circular beautiful kind of thing, oh, yeah. which is Trash actually cam. a sort of dead end. Yeah, it's a dead end because you can't put cards in it. However, mm. for the studio, it's brilliant, and so it's got more of than than your average computer. And I don't run out. However, things like Adaptive Verb, for example, or uh, Diva when you're running it in the top mode and some of those more adaptive over especially actually you can't even run more than one or two of them um that that would be absolutely useful so if, if they could push something out that isn't an audio unit extension or a vst extension maybe there is such a thing out there i don't know that would be hyper useful i personally i wouldn't use it now because i don't see the need for it um it's different with the with the ua stuff isn't it because that sort of the, the plugins are locked into the whole system, isn't it? So you you, you buy yeah. the thing and it's it's locked in. Um, but no, I, I, for live stuff as well. The other thing is the latency. If it improves the latency for the plugins that I'm using, that might be a help. But I'm not quite sure if that's the case. I only say this because I've never really taken any notice of latency that much, unless you can hear a problem. But I had to do a project where you had two identical files and we processed them in slightly different ways. So for example, this one would have a reverb on it and this one would have a flanger and a reverb on it. And then they would be started at identical times 
and you would cross mix between the two. So effectively, you could have a joystick that, that went between a reverbed version and a flanged version, um, but they were files running. And I really noticed the differences in latency because if you've got the identical file in the first place with some embellishments, you can hear the thing phasing if it's not absolutely 100% locked in. And I suddenly realized that most of the mixing I'd ever been doing, each, each channel was slightly out by a few milliseconds. So you only really notice it if you're using microphones and so forth. Um, but it was really apparent. And suddenly I was putting audio delays in, delaying by a number of samples every now and then. So it made me think that quite a lot of the mixes that I produced in the past that had sounded a bit smeary or whatever might be down to this, this latency thing. So if you could lock everything to a consistent latency and work to it, um, I think that would be helpful. The other, the other side of that is you then spend your entire life, instead of making music, adjusting things by a millisecond <laughs> and then listening to both the speakers. Yeah, it sort of ruins the listening experience <laughs> ultimately, doesn't it? It appeals to the OCD kind of in me, but, yeah, it, <laughs> but it, not it, anything else. Yeah, absolutely. I know, Gaz, I mean, I, you don't use power plugins, do you? You don't use your... I, I know you, you have have done uh, i yeah, mean there are various use, reasons yeah. why some people don't but uh, i mean yeah. the wave stuff it's very popular in the live department because you get uh cards mm. digigrid cards for sound grid cards for um for various yeah. different uh, digital desks i think right mm, that makes a lot of sense i mean i've got like oh uh, I'm, I'm probably gonna make myself very unpopular here now because uh I, I i used to use the power core system the tc power core system and i also had the um the focus right liquid mix which promised so much actually it was really good but unfortunately wasn't supported beyond a certain point um but you know the problem with those systems are you know that where you have to take them with you everywhere you go and if you you know if you take it you know and i was doing a lot of remote work back then so it was always having to take the power supplies the extra boxes and the cables and stuff you know in order to be able to make this work now i was wondering with this because it's using like waves plugins does it if you then say take the session elsewhere without that plugged in will it just just revert back to running them natively i mean or, or will you have to kind that of that would go be in good and... if it was the case wouldn't it because yeah, at least you that, would yeah yes absolutely i mean because you know like the uad thing as as good as they sound uh they it, they do essentially it does does essentially become like a sort of like dongle in a way doesn't it you know you have to have it connected um and uh you know sometimes you know i kind of think oh the uad thing i mean as good as it is the, you know the, now and again they'll do like an apollo and you'll get like a free satellite and people think wow look at that it's amazing but really it's just a way to kind of go oh i can actually run more uad plugins let's buy some more and you're kind of locked into that uh, that world but this seems a little bit different in that respect that it's uh you know that the plugins can be run natively so that's quite you know, I think that's quite interesting. Um, I'm a bit angry with Waves at the moment. I don't know if anyone else has kind of experienced this. Uh, they keep offering these $29 um, daily deals and they oh, sometimes seem a bit too good to be true. And I've recently done that and clicking through the install has kind of now made my other plugins, Waves plugins, out of date or something. I've updated to some 10 framework <laughs> which i somehow just wanted to get a plugin working yes 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 whatever 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 and now uh, i have to pay to get all my other waves plugins up to 10 which i'm a bit uh, about so just watch out for that one because it is uh it is a little bit of a gotcha there but um uh i yeah uh, well hmm here's something now have you seen the clark technic <laughs> 1176 LA2A and Pultec that have just been that you can now get it's like they're cheaper than the plugins physic you know hardware not digital models real they're 180 quid for an 1176 180 oh, quid see. for a Pultec 270 quid or thereabouts for an LA2A which is ridiculous when you look at what UA are charging for their hardware units I mean the LA2A the UA one is three and a half grand so versus 270 quid or, and these are done at Midas as well. So, you know, which means they're going to be, they're going to be good. Is that this uh, guy? Is that the KT, KT2A? Yeah, look at this. It's unbelievable. I mean, I, I think the KT is becoming, a, you know, which is the LA2A is going to be available. I think next week, I think again, there's a, I think the 1176 and the, um, 
and the Poltec are going to be out in January. I mean, these things are ridiculous. I mean, you can buy, you know, you, you can buy like an 1176 and a Poltec for 360 quid or something for, for, the, for the pair. I mean, that is an awesome, you know, one of the greatest sort of signal chains. Uh, wow, okay. Uh, the LA2A is really cool because it's got the stereo functionality should you wish to chain another one with it. So, uh, I mean, I know I'm going off topic a little bit, but I well, mean... no, it's sort are... of, I mean, yeah, just get the hardware. I guess you could only run one instance and you're not limited by... DSP only run one instance, of course. And it's, you know, for, you know, you could have it in, in, in a, in a, in a send uh, situation. Uh, I'm very keen to get all three of these units. I mean, I've, I've dreamt about having these, but I've always felt they're just way out of my price range so now i mean this is unbelievable uh, i'm incredibly excited about it and with the clark technic badge on there as well just kind of gives it a certain uh, you know clark technic's a, obviously part now of the music tribe brand but um is still synonymous with a, with quality and you know midas design transformers it, pff, these things look amazing and they kind of make the plugins. I mean, yes, you can use the plugins, obviously. Well, certainly for live. Versions. I mean, you've got no latest. I suppose the other yeah. thing is, I mean, it's, it's funny, isn't it? Kind of going back to this scenario where there used to be ways of offloading. I mean, I'm sure if you, you could have run a laptop with a bunch with like main stage on it and use uh, maybe what's the uh, AV, AVB to bus because the AVB will work between computers on Ethernet. Maybe mm. if you've got an AVB connectivity, you could offload it that way uh, yeah. just over the net because the the, 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 the the capacity of the AVB bus and also the latency of the ABV bus is re AVB bus is really low. I, I've not yeah. used AVB at all. I, I don't know if anyone else has, but it's it, it, you know that's something that might be worth bearing in mind. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah. I, I, and also, you know, the, there's been that sort of network processing thing for logic hasn't there for years and reaper as well um and also actually cubase you know cubase has had that for for a long time hasn't it where you can essentially offload processing power yeah. to another unit so I, I, it's probably is a latency issue so the avb thing you're right that could actually be a very a very cool way around it i guess with this waves thing though it's all neater it's just a you know it's a simpler i guess more of a i'm assuming more of a plug and play kind of scenario um but I think you're right with the live thing. I think that's where this stuff really excels. Uh, just coming back to that earlier point that you were saying, though, I mean, I've got a Mac Pro, what's now five years old or something, but I'm never anywhere near using up the headroom when I'm working on music. Video, different thing altogether, but music, I've still got bags of bags of headroom. Um, so that would definitely sort of not make me interested in external processes these, these days anyway. But. Yeah, well, that's what I was saying. I mean, we talked about that before, mm. didn't we, that, that there's yep. a ton of press. Uh, I'm going to uh, maybe uh, have a quick word from our friends over at uh, uh, Isotope because it feels like we're about 25 minutes in. So stay tuned. Oh, actually, no, I'm not. What I'm going to do, because I'm, I'm meant to do this before, I'm going to plug our event. Uh, we've got Sonic State Live event, and uh, then I'll do the uh, Sonic State Live 22nd of November yes. in Bristol at DBS Music, uh, where we have performances from Battery Operated Orchestra. Check them out. Uh, Chris Calcutt, who yeah, yeah. works for Novation but does his own live stuff as well, and uh, some other guests to be announced. Uh, we've mm -hmm. also got talks. I've got. I've came up with this idea that basically we have uh, local synthesis people, you know, personalities come down with an instrument that we would put on stage. We'd build an interview around it, and they could say, well. Uh, this is why I like this. And at the same time, maybe discuss a little bit about their path through through their careers or whatever. So we've got Adrian Utley with a mini Moog. I think Will Gregory may bring the Polyvox. I'm not sure yet. Uh, Dave Spears, I'm not sure what he's bringing yet. He was talking about bringing the uh, eight voice, but it depends whether it's well, because obviously a lot of these synths <laughs> aren't always at hunt tip top. Uh, I, I'm not sure. I was going to try and talk Ty Unwin into bringing down like his mobile orchestral writing gig uh, rig and show us maybe how he would go about building up a an orchestral cue you know on the fly because i mean as we know he works mm. incredibly fast and as incredibly successful yeah. and then in the evening we've got gigs uh so if you want to come to that uh the the result the actual um url is uh, let me put that up there uh sonic state uh live dbs music oh dear that's not capital i that looks terrible i'm just gonna change that uh bitly sonic live 18 will take you to the ticketing and you can get that and i've also just had confirmation that a friend uh ben shannon who designed one of our t-shirts also works for cm uh, cbc which is a canadian broadcasting company has talked his producer into flying him over to bristol <laughs> to cover Ooh, the event yeah so we're gonna, you, there's every All chance right. it'll be on cbc which is you know that's like the b for canada <laughs> wow. so i mean that's 
amazing. Cool. And he said he's mm. booking the flight, so I'm not making that up. That's amazing. So it's going to be a fun, a very fun oh, day. So, you know, do fun, come along. Fun, fun, fun. It's going to, like the last one, well, the first one we've done, this is going to be the second Sonic Live, isn't it? And the first one, for those who were there, was was a real barrel of laughs as well. So apart from it being an interesting thing, it's also going to be, there's going to be a lot of uh, a lot of laughter, a lot of fun. And I mean, like Dave and Ty, we're going to get a lot of value, value for belly laughs, I think, from it. Uh, I'm dead excited about it. It's going to be brilliant. Absolutely. We've got a second, uh, um, we've got a guy from DBS Music, lecturer Liam O'Malane, uh, aka The Sound Tutor. We've got like a second stage where we'll have other performers coming in that will be filling in the changeover times and any uh, gaps there are, because we'll be live streaming this event in the evening. We will, we won't film, we'll film the interviews and stuff and pu publish them later. So do come. Please do come. I just put to plug that again. If you go to Bitly mm -hmm. Sonic Live eighteen, that will take you to the ticketing, and uh, and then uh, you know there's still some tickets left. Uh, although well, there are numbers are limited. I will limited. Say that. Yeah, yeah, it is limited. Yeah, so yeah. first come first serve. Absolutely. Uh, so anyway, let's get on to um, our friends on the isotope. So this is a message about RX the new features of RX the industry standard seven. and leader in audio repair for music and post production. And with RX-7, we've introduced groundbreaking new ways to quickly and easily fix and manipulate audio. Take the game-changing Repair Assistant, an intelligent helper that can detect noise, clipping, clicks, hum, and more. Also new in RX-7 is Music Rebalance, a powerful source separation tool. Drums too loud? Vocals not loud enough? Let's fix that. You can also create instrumental versions of songs by removing the vocal elements. You can now alter the pitch without affecting the timing of your audio, and conversely, alter the time without affecting the pitch with the new variable time and variable pitch modules. Using the new dialog contour, you can improve the performance of a line or even create a new performance by altering the pitch contour of the dialog, therefore adjusting the intonation of the speaker. And introducing Dialog Dereverb, a module powered by machine learning to reduce the presence of reverberations around dialogue. RX-7, a new frontier in audio repair. So there we go. And uh, we have a winner for last week's competition. Uh, the winner is called Dano DC at Dano DC. He said, is it my lucky day for some free audio magic? Well, you know what, Dano mm -hmm. DC? It certainly is. Yeah, you won the, uh, last week's competition. So congratulations. Please get in touch. And we'll get the Isotope people to drop that into your uh, account. And you'll be able to uh, be rocking it. As soon as you get in touch. Anyway, um, but we've also got a competition <laughs> yeah. for next week. So uh, we're looking again, win isotopes RX7. I'm looking for the hashtag industry standard and the hashtag RX7 to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. That's the hashtag industry standard, the hashtag RX7 to at Sonic State and at Isotope I'd Inc. I just anyway. done an I just done another I just done another one with RX7 um of actually jumping jack flash vocals on to drive my car beetles because i've been messing you know it's just so funny to do it you know so mick jagger singing jumping jack flash over <laughs> the beatles backing track it, it's like whoa i mean it is it is like um uh it's magic mashup. i tell you magic it's incredible yeah ridiculous <laughs> well um let's get on to another topic anyway what, what do you think of this this is pretty cool this is called Spiralala, and it's uh, by Poland's Pan Generato, a kind of collective of uh, artists and uh, technical people. And this is in the... Uh, I can't pronounce it. Doesn't that look great? That's like an installation in uh, the Session Philharmonic. Uh, and you sample into it and it plays down the staircase. That just looks absolutely brilliant. Apart from the fact there's nobody there apart from that person, which would probably, if you're there on your own, that would make it brilliant. But, I mean, with a bunch of people kind of squeaking, coughing, and kind of shouting in the reverb space, it might not be quite such the uh, ethereal experience. I don't know whether um, I'll, I'll start with you, Dom. Have you ever done any uh, installation stuff? I mean, you know, I know you're, the app you're working on is quite an ambient thing. I mean, have you ever done anything? Yeah, like that? sleep. Actually, I was going to say no, but you've just reminded me. I, I used to work in a synth shop in Bristol, 
um, called The Rock Shop. And then uh, after that, I think there was a one called ABC Music. We got a call one day. I was about 20, 20 21, I'm guessing. Um, and it turned out that it was a British aerospace who were interested in some plane sounds for a thing that they were building. Um, so I went, yeah, I can do that. Yeah, really yeah, great, you know. And it turned out that this thing was a huge um, kind of semicircular dome into which they would drive a tank or, or some kind of weapon. Um, and then around the, the dome, they were projecting a background with slide projectors. This is, this is kind of, you know, early 80s technology, I suppose. Um, and they would then laser these planes around. And the idea was you'd sit in this tank and you'd try and hit these planes. Um, and they had a surround sound system that meant the noise of the planes would get mapped as these things went around. It was a simulation, but it was most, I never actually saw this thing. Um, but they were saying, telling me how amazing it was going to be and what it was costing. So I had to do six plane sounds that would then get panned out. And I never told them, and I've never said until this point, but the main plane sound I just took from Top Gun. So that is the main plane sound for, <laughs> for British aerospace. I think I'm safe now. I think it's probably not in statute of limitations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so yes, I have, but unfortunately, I never got to experience it. I mean, that thing looks really good, really, really good. I've always wanted to do something like that, but in a tube station, so you can get um, speakers up and down the tube, whooshing past you as you're waiting on the tube station, maybe kind of going through either side. But that looks brilliant. I'm not quite sure what's what's going on i looked at the website it says it's a neo-baroque sonic trompe l'oeil made with digital technology and that kind of lost me but i presume it's I optical really triggers i think what's happening is there are oh, okay. optical triggers that are going uh, as it rolls down there are little uh cameras that uh that that go past and trigger bits of the sample i mean as far as i understand it uh, i mean this was i, I should point mm. out that this was uh, i found this on uh, uh, peter kern's excellent uh, cdm link mm. uh, and he pointed me at the other stuff and they've got some really cool really really cool stuff i mean these kind they made these kind of uh apparently poland has quite a, a strong history of electronic experimental electronic music and uh, a, a lot of it's to do with optical to electronica so I, i'm guessing this was sort of drawing upon some of that stuff but it looks great i mean as with many of these spaces you know you, when you're in the car park mm. and you shut the door we did that at synthfest didn't we you <laughs> we shut the door all, in yeah. the car park and that was just amazing oh, glorious but the problem is is finding enough finding enough quiet to actually be able to record it properly. Have you got it in your phone? Did you record it? I'm just looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Will it come across? I wonder. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the, the, it must have been, it must have been like down to about 10 Hertz. I reckon it was just astonishing. Mm. So those kind of acoustic space things are great. I mean, but I think I suspect to enjoy that, you know, being there alone or certainly with only a couple of other people is the way forward. Yeah. I mean, this is a lovely, um, this is a really lovely installation though, isn't it? It's like taking a really interesting place to start with and then sort of fantasizing what could you do with it. Um, there were a few questions I had about this installation though. Um, how many of those, how many balls could you set off down there though? I mean, and you know, trying to, because ah. if you were to do like a percussive thing and like kind of did like sort of maybe beatbox sounds and then throw them down and then trying to get a bunch of them going and try and get rhythms going and stuff. I was all, I was really interested in. Um, well, it looked like it looked to me. It looked like sorry. It looked like to me at the beginning. Uh, what she was mm -hmm. doing was imprinting that ball, whether it's with RFID or something like that, so that it it carried the information about the sample that she was that she had made. But I don't know if that's totally true. Mm. I don't know. So, sorry, Dom, you were going to come in. Oh no, I was just going to say there's a good example of where you might need need your waves box to offload all your plugins, um, so that you've got no latency in the way that it's doing. But I think I think you're right. I think it literally is triggering as it's going down. Uh, I'd love to know, I'd love to see the gear list and how they've done it. I think maybe it's around it. There is an amazing studio in Poland, not far from Krakow, I think, which I've never been to. Again, I just saw it online. The most amazing, weird building that they've made with amazing synths now. I'll try and dig it out because um, uh, we did some work out there and I wanted to see it. Um, a lot of people use the, the Philharmonic Orchestra out in Poland for recording and uh, They've, they've built this studio, obviously, on the back of, or at least with some decent live rooms for that kind of stuff. But they had a really good collection of uh, of old synths and all sorts when I saw it. And it's just a fascinating kind of room. So I'll, I'll try and dig it out. But, uh, yeah, I, I love this kind of stuff. I also love that kind of things that you can get where kids can get interactive. So it's a bit more touchable. You know, you can go and touch a sculpture and it makes a noise and it's very uh, hands-on. This seems to be like a hands-off experience, I think. Um, mm. But, yeah, what a, what a thing to, to listen to.
Well, that was one thing about Music Messer. They used to have, uh, uh, I don't know if they still got it, um, but they did something similar at Superbooth in one part, I think it was in Superbooth, where it's just this, there's a German artist who just makes ele- uh, mechanical and uh, acoustic stuff for kids. And so the, in, in, at Messer, because there was uh, rapidly expanding uh, areas of unused halls, uh, at Music Mess. So there was this huge floor space where the kids would get bussed in by the busload and they'd get half an hour or an hour in this place and run around. And it was beautiful to watch. It was just such a... Mm. It sort of made... You know, amongst all the kind of corporate but nonsense that you get at a big major trade show like that, it was like, well, this is kind of mm. why we're all doing it and where it all started. And that was that was lovely. I forget the details. We filmed a piece on it because it was Andreas from Superbooth who said, follow me, you've got to see this. And Andy went with him and they filmed this beautiful sort of thing and did a piece with the artist. I'll see if I can dig it out whether it's it might have been something we did even pre YouTube so I don't know if it's even there but yeah all this installation stuff is great absolutely great I think a jolly good stuff yeah. um yeah that's uh, if you go to a play if you go to uh, basically this is called what's it called pangenerator.com and there's all these projects that they do uh and this is uh, apparatum was another one which was really beautiful so uh, uh do check their stuff out and I know Peter Kern's on top of a lot more of this kind of installation and art stuff than I am but so I just um grab it when i see him do it because i don't <laughs> find out about it uh right let's see who wants to who wants a, a throwback app here we go let's have a look at this this is the new digital d1 audio kit and this is kind of a, a 64 voice ipad app uh works on pcm slash virtual analog kind of like in the style of the uh you know d110 the d50 uh jd 1080, JB 1080, O1W, that kind of stuff. But it's not its not trying to load their patches or anything, but it comes with a one and a half gig uh, 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 sample library that adds it. And I was just looking into this, oh, it's 499. It's, you know, yet another reason why someone might actually want uh, to use the iPad as a dedicated sound source. In fact, mm. almost like offloading some of that, you know, it, it kind of brings that whole thing up again. Uh, and this, this looked fun. I mean, but the thing mm. that was really interesting about this is Audio Kit is is an actual plugin framework. So it's an open source plugin framework that anyone can access. And you basically, uh, I, I found more about this, and you can audio kit, uh, Synth1 is one of their first things, but basically yeah. they are, uh, audio kit is kind of, I guess it's a bit like Juice, but it's an alternative open source. So you can download mm. this and make your own stuff for iOS and Mac OS. Uh, and, and this is what that's built in. I just thought it was really fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And it's, uh, I mean, so they've, released the synth one was their first kind of release using this platform and you know completely free synthesizer providing you've got a uh, an ipad and is actually very very good indeed um uh, now i think it's uh they're doing this now as um to try and help pay to maintain the audio kit sort of platform by by releasing some commercial products using this platform and uh which i think is a a very good way of doing it and keeping the costs very reasonable um but the synth one was really quite excellent really in terms of its uh its scope and unbelievable really for free so that was certainly showing that the audio kit framework is uh is highly capable so this is a really interesting development and i guess it is going to lead on to some of the discussion of the new apple releases Are we gonna well yeah i guess so i mean but we'll, we'll come mm. on to that because obviously we know we've okay. got that that was going to be next i thought i'd try and get some of this stuff out of the way but yeah i don't know um, do yeah. you dominic do you use any of this i mean no you're working on an audio based uh, ios app do you yeah yeah, yeah. What, what framework have you used? I've used Audio Kit. I've, I've gone to native code on the Mac, but I use, I've used Audio Kit for other stuff, and I nearly use it. It's just a couple of tiny things that I'm doing which aren't covered yet. Um, I mean, audio, firstly, Audio Kit is an amazing project. It's a guy called, I had to write it down, Ori Prochatska, um, who's behind the whole thing. And it really is, if you think of it like a wrapper, to sit inside above the kind of core iPad stuff. And you code into that and it does stuff. And coding iOS apps has become much, much easier than it used to be because Apple have produced a language called Swift, which is a bit like the old basic really in the old days. You don't have to worry about complex coding. You can say, you know, draw a picture here, make it bigger, that kind of stuff. Um, And if you use that on AudioKit, AudioKit is a Swift library. Um, it just does the same for the for the for the audio stuff. So the synth that you talked about is it synth one, I think. Synth um, one, yeah, and digital D one as well. 
right you can you can program that really with very very little extra work with this library you can literally say put slider here play sound through it move slider change filter yeah I mean, just incredible stuff and that's what first made me think i could even write an ipad app to be honest to produce it so i'm, I'm just writing a kind of sleep app that allows you to come up with kind of chilled out noises and stuff um and that really opened the door to that that whole project to be honest they the release the d1 that's come out i got it yesterday i've got a mate actually it's a nice circular story i've got a mate called dean daughters who has a company called electronic sounds quite a small company but they make sounds so um they did some work with vengeance um and he is i think part of the guys as some of his sounds are on the d1 and he got me into what the ipad can do so i've started suddenly downloading loads of ipad synths and sequences plugging it into um one of these little pre-sonus boxes up the back as the audio interface and using it to sequence things like the deluge or play sounds and the ipad is amazing i've got an air air 2 i think so it's kind of two generations back but it is amazing and I, and just to get back on topic um the D1, I love it, actually, really, really love it. It is fundamentally a sample player. It's like a ROM player, um, but it doesn't feel like that. It feels like a really funky little synth that you can use. Mm -hmm. And 64 voices, it doesn't seem to take up too much power within the iPad. Um, yeah, the sounds are reminiscent of the D50 and all that kind of stuff, but it's 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 got a bit of sparkle, actually, and it's really worth 4 99 I mean, you can't go wrong. I think the price goes up after the first few days. But yeah, big up, big up Audio Kit and what they're doing. It's complete. That guy, Ori, has worked so hard. He's so responsive. He answered my questions when I was asking him stuff. And to produce a team of people and the system that he's done from nothing, I think he deserves to sell them for forty ninety nine, let alone four ninety nine. <laughs> oh no, excellent. There seem to be these kind of code collectives which are coming together. You know, you've got VCV rack, you've got uh, oh. this, and they're they're just sort of people who seem to be working for the greater good where well, there is a commercial side of it as well so, so i don't know it's pretty cool um and as we know there have been some new developments yesterday apple uh um announced a couple of things i mean the first thing is the new ipad pro which has got a super fast processor in it new thinner profile you know like yeah you know, it, it, i know gaz is gassing over this a lot um, it's a lot of money i mean it's not not yeah. an insignificant investment but the big probably the biggest I mean, the, the headlines to grab from this are hmm. uh, it's USB-C connectivity. Clack uh, which, not be gone! Clack well, not be gone! Do you think, do you think, yeah. or is it not, are you, are you sure it's not just going to replace yeah. it with a different set of clack well, It's a, it's a USB-C <laughs> control, so I mean, it, so at least you could just go directly, couldn't you, to your USB device, providing you've got the right cable with the USB-C plug on it, so... Uh, you know, do you think you could use something like that on it you know so you've got this with mm. get an access. yeah you can what yeah except having plugging storage into it would be completely because uh, you can't actually import anything so that would be a bit you've of a waste got of time. still limitations with that yeah which is still Ooh. annoying but, but the other thing uh, is obviously mm. they're taking the headphone socket off which i think is a major mm. major major yeah turn off because quite it often is. you might use an ipad and the headphone output is perfectly mm -hmm. adequate for some sound situations if you don't want to plug in power and an audio interface you can't mm -hmm. do that anymore and people say oh you don't need it it's like yes you do latency over bluetooth yeah. whatever way you look at it is not acceptable for real-time audio processing or playing no that is that is the big that is the horrid bit of it however i have just put an order in for one <laughs> today <laughs> Uh, yes, so uh, I am quite excited about it because it, it, it does represent, anyway, the <laughs> most significant development, I think, since the iPad has been released. And it's uh, I'm quite interested in the HEVC sort of built-in video decoding stuff. Is that the HVENC stuff or H? Yeah. Oh, that oh, is very yeah. fast, yeah. That, that yeah, very fast. Well. So, you know, we've been using uh, the um, Luma Fusion video editing app. I know you've been using it as well, Nick, with your... That's just amazing. It's so good. Yeah, absolutely. So um, that's why I'm very keen to try with the new iPad, just how that is, how that feels to work with. You know, I, um, as I've mentioned earlier with my Mac Pro, video tends to bring it to its knees a little bit. So I'm very keen to see what it's like to, you know, I don't have huge technical requests of the video editor. So it's it's more really just whether the video editing is a fluid and... Yes. Um, I can, process, I can say because I mean uh, we did Knobcon, yeah. uh, not Knobcon, Synthfest, and all the mm. video I published like eight or ten videos, and that was all done on 
edited on the iPad, and that's an iPad Air yeah. 2 as well. I mean, and, we, and it was faster. If you're using 4K footage, it actually processes it and renders it faster than our, this massive desktop machine. It's bonkers. And that's an old yeah. one, so goodness knows what is going to happen there. So I don't know, but yeah, I can understand, yeah. you know, why to a degree. I still can't think of a reason why I would want to spend that money, or certainly on the iPad Pro, if I've got an iPad that will work okay anyway. What I want is the ability to be able mm. to plug that USB-C adapter in and go, mm -hmm. okay, I want to access yeah. all the files on this hard drive. I want to write files in and out of this thing. I want to be, I want it to yeah. join the rest of the gang, you know, part of the real world. But I'm not getting it. frustrating. I mean, I've, I have, I am using an app called iMazing uh, on the Mac, which really helps with the whole data transfer aspect, um, mm. which is worth looking into if you do use an iPad or iPhone in conjunction with desktop software. It's a lot, lot nicer than the clunky, horrible gateway of iTunes, which I can't believe they still you know, it's so rubbish, the iTunes portal for that data transfer. Yeah, it's so, crummy. It's absolutely yeah, really crummy. rubbish. But I, yeah, um, so have a look at iMazing if you are, if, okay, if you are in that, that out. situation. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, does Dominic, does the does, does any of these new Apple releases, because obviously we've got the new Mac Mini as well, which actually does look really cool. Yeah. I mean, it's about time, I think, that we had some new hardware. I know some other guys writing software were like saying, actually, do you know what? We're, we're getting stuffed here because we need new hardware to support the the new code that we're writing, particularly on the audio and the video front. Um, I mean, the, the Mac Pro we talked about earlier is a classic example. I was worried they might bring one out within a, you know six months of me buying that two or three years ago, and it was old then. Um, shame we didn't see a new iMac. Um, I know the iMac Pro came out last time. It does seem to be, I don't know, clearly they would love to release all these ones in one big hit, so they're obviously taking their time with some stuff. But, but from an iPad point of view, I use my iPad all the time. Um, I never thought I would, but it's mainly for browsing until recently, you know, on the music stuff. And it's still a little bit of a, um, a nice to have on the music stuff, I guess. Um, but the more I use it, the more impressed I am with, with what you can do with it. Um, but I just use it for doing things, whether it be email or, or you know, watching a video or, or moving around the house. And I can't justify that kind of cash. Yeah, on essentially what, is, new. what you could yeah. effectively do on a, 99 quid android tablet exactly. i mean that's the thing that the, the other thing is is that people are saying well where are the pro apps where's logic pro on this where's final cut sure. pro on this where are the pro apps that i'm going to be able to use this pro yeah. hardware well for? adobe have kind of embraced it, haven't they with the full photoshop now on ipad so that's sort of, uh, yeah i but, guess you know, i mean one, one thing that i did notice creative on cloud the yeah, I don't, one thing I did notice on this, rather than the uh, on the Mac Mini, sorry to interrupt there, guys, because the Mac mm. Mini, if I just quickly go to this, the Mac Mini's got uh, four mm. USB-C ports, two USB-3 ports. I mean, that's the sort of connectivity that is nice yeah. to have in a Mac Mini. That is pretty cool. Yeah. So three Thunderbolt 3s. But the other thing is, you know, you've got all the blurb here, and it sort of says simply powerful, and you get all of the kind of, it'll do all of this stuff. But there was, uh, where was it? There was actually... Um, Ah, hold on. Where was it? Maybe it's an overview. I can't remember now. But that it says somewhere, great for uh, uh, for maybe creativity. And it's sort of like there's a bit about uh, I, I can't find it now. But there was a, there was actually a kind of graphic and stuff with it running main stage. And you just thought, wow, finally, mm. Apple are actually mm, yeah. kind of selling it on the fact that you might want to use this in that scenario. And it's uh, you know it's, it's been years since that's happened. Yeah, those those minis are like. Um... I've always felt underpowered to me, even trying to use one in an office with someone trying to, you know, just do word processing or whatever. They're just like really slow to boot, aren't they? And that one mm. looks like a sensible, a sensible one. I, I think you can do, you can even change the memory after you've bought it, which would be an, a world first for Apple. There's a bit of expandability mm -hmm. going on in there. And it does feel like you could actually buy it and use it for something sensible now. Um, mm. And I think uh, of, of the bunch, I think you're right, Nick. I think that's that's the exciting one to actually look at. And I, I agree, somewhere it does mention about the fact that you can use it for live music and stuff. I mean, if, if I was much more hardcore into iPad audio, and there really is a lot of stuff you can do with Beatmaker and, and various things coming out, I, I could justify it because there's a means to an end there, isn't there? But, but I really can't at the moment. It's, there's better yeah. things to spend that kind of cash on, I think. I, I use my iPad every week in a professional audio situations connected to a Midas MR18, which is like the Behringer XR18. But um, it's just the most glorious situation I've ever had with music technology, I think. Just that 
it's so, like because I, I uh, going into uh, a studio and I take it with me, goes on the floor, put the iPad on a music stand, and then we do kind of like combination of re- recording sessions and rehearsal sessions, you know, sort of, um, or rather the sort of writing sessions using that workflow. And it's just, it just, comp- and using Cubasis as the, um, as the door. Uh, and cause I'm like an instrumentalist. So I've got my bass and my pedals and my synths and stuff. And, um, and I've got the iPad on the music stand and it's just the most kind of integrated sort of workflow where I can be a musician and can do the recording and engineering simultaneously it's just a glorious kind of system yeah, it's so fluid way of working I, I i love it i that's why i've that's why i've decided to go that this way with getting the new ipad really it's just because that workflow i've never you know i mean it's quite specific to me because you know i guess not a lot of people are do are, are being that musician and engineer in a room with other musicians or whatever but um it's just it works so well i mean and cubasis to be fair has been developed so much by Steinberg um uh it's you know it's not the whole it's not the whole thing yet but now it supports you know audio units full screen audio units as well um and you know many many channels of automation and using apple pencil for putting in automation same thing like on luma fusion as well is is amazing it feels like it's the next it does feel like the next level it feels like like I, the the like a like a, um, a laptop type of workflow feels quite old-fashioned when you get into that it's so fast and it's so responsive it's just like ooh, it's good you know so um i think that's definitely the, the future isn't it i mean and you can see it already and that i mean you sold it on sold it to me i mean when you're in that situation and you're actually working with your ipad are you coding the programming the drums and so forth and you're actually recording takes into it for what what do you end up with in terms of, of content on the ipad when you when you finish the writing a, a song uh well so it's like a whole band um so i take audio you know drum mics keyboards guitar bass oh, right in it you know and then uh <laughs> and it's it's just little things like this now this doesn't sound like a big deal but um say i haven't got my speakers plugged into it so i'm just i'm just using it just just to kind of capture what we're doing in the room and if we want to have a little listen to the playback and say i usually take a little amp with me as well so uh like a roland keyboard amp to use as a monitor just uh just for quick playback reasons but if i haven't got that with me yeah exactly (laughs) forget that now (laughs) yeah i do i do no i've got it plugged in the outputs of the the mr18 ah okay right (laughs) yeah yeah no so 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 that so that the, the amp is connected to the audio interface essentially but but if I haven't got the amp with me, I just yank the cable out and then instantly it just starts playing out of the built-in speakers. I didn't ah, have okay. to go into the configuration and, you know, and then, and then after we've listened to it and we want to carry on recording, just plug it back in and then everything's configured. I don't need to go and swap right. around mm. and just little things like that. Just make the whole experience well, yeah, I mean, the, but really yeah, fluid. Whether or not that still be available when you're using USB-C, you know, these are things we don't know, but I, I appreciate them. True. But it's interesting. True. I mean, that Apple have, uh, you know, finally, look, Mac mini is a stalwart. Lots of people who are playing live are using Mac minis for main stage mm. and for playback. Will you be able to run it stuff, headless so. though? It's really hard to get them to run headless. Um, uh, I don't know. That is a real problem because of the, well, you can do it, but at a compromise to the security, you'd have to uh, you know, I, the, the I login think, part. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, that's a good mm. question. I couldn't answer that, yeah. but yeah, it's a possibility. Well, anyway, I, I mean, we had to cover it. It's another big event, and there was some mm. new stuff. It wasn't just a kind of different color iPhone, you know, so there was actually a little bit more <laughs> going on there. Um, let's yeah. take a look at this one then. I have to be quick. I didn't realise what the time was. This is uh, some sounds from the new uh, Spitfire Eric Whitaker Choir, um, which is Eric Whitaker, Grammy winning composer, very good on choral stuff that uh, the guys at Spitfire got in and he came over and recorded like 13 days with this 23 piece choral uh, group. And. Uh, it does sound really lovely. I mean, it's quite interesting that it's not as bombastic and bombastic as you might expect from a, a, a pricey library. 
but the detail and the reality is really lovely. Ah. So this is the new, as I said, it's the new Spitfire Audio, Eric Whittaker Choir. Uh, I actually went to, I was in London last week with my daughter for, uh, we went to see the musical, which was, what was the musical? The musical was um, Heathers, which is dark as you like, if you ever go, but it's good. But anyway, I happened to be there and it's like, oh, I can make it to, uh, they had a launch event at the uh, uh, Greenwich Observatory and Eric was there. And what, more importantly, the choir he recorded was there and we got to sit in the middle of the planetarium, which is a very dead acoustic space. And they sat around the outside and they sang two uh, pieces, one of which was uh, a contemporary piece and the other bit was, uh, was a, a vocal arrangement of Hurt, uh, the uh, Trent Reznor song. And honestly, they, I mean, these singers are world class and they were just, over here so the the best one of the best sopranos in the world was there singing mm -hmm. long sustained and it was a very magical experience and the, the the thing itself what was quite interesting about this is uh eric um was saying the the, the thing the there was there was quite a lot of this philosophical stuff but ultimately there's the the essence of the human voice is that it can convey so much emotion in without any kind of uh, without any words necessarily and what he found he was doing he recorded the stuff over 13 days so very epic and he was pulling this stuff out of each of the singers and he says that he feels that a lot of that was captured which is why it feels such an emotive thing i mean it's not cheap uh, it's uh, i think it's like 240 gigabytes and it's uh, it's 399 reduced from 549 so it's a bunch of cash but it's it seems like it's one of those very special things and it's spitfire you know obviously feel very strongly about it and they you know they'll probably sell a decent amount of them um I'll come to you, Dom, first. Do you use library stuff? I mean, because these are the sort of things you can't you can't just you know get an ooze no, sample exactly. from an ad work, can you? Yeah, I'd love <laughs> I'd love to be able to be justified to buy those kind of things because that's it sounds amazing. The, the attention to detail that those guys seem to have. I'm a relatively new convert to their or to being aware of their sound libraries, and it, it really is amazing. I mean, I I just love. Well, wouldn't we all to to get the gig to do a major film and be able to go out and do all that kind of stuff with strings? Um, I've done some orchestral uh, remake work where I've you know not with a real orchestra. I've made up orchestras by throwing in lots of different samples and building it up section by section, and you can do some good stuff. But but no is the answer to that. I I, I haven't. Um, but I really would love to get into it. It just sounds amazing. Um, the, the 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 quality and attention to detail on that stuff is just brilliant. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, one of the things I didn't realise. I mean, Spitfire have grown enormously. They say they've got sixty people working for them now. I mean, they really, really wow. are. They are. That, and all the people I spoke oh. to, because I spoke to some photographers, various people, and this guy saying, "Oh, yeah, he was a photographer," and they said, "Oh, I'm freelance, but I'm I'm just coming on board, and I've worked with them for years, and they're, they're just a great company to work mm -hmm. for." And they seem to encompass a very positive and kind of uplifting kind of vibe to the stuff that they do. They don't just sort of hack it out. And this thing's been four years in the making, you know. And mm -hmm. Eric was there, and he was conducting all from memory. Uh, in this room and it was just it was what was great to see is the quality and the caliber of the people involved behind what is ultimately you know a, mm. a plug-in you can't see all of that stuff that went in mm. so i mean they were trying to demonstrate i think that to a very good degree i mean we know we mm. i use the spitfire lab stuff quite a lot now yeah, it sounds too. great but yes. i mean that's free this isn't free mm. so <laughs> <laughs> no but yeah I mean, we've mentioned labs before but absolutely it's a no-brainer isn't it it's um labs they release I think is it once a month they release a new a, a new sound um, a, a new instrument for it and it's a brilliant idea really because it really does give you a a really nice um way into the spitfire thing and the musicality of everything that spitfire put out though is outstanding isn't it and this this is just this is just beautiful i'm a, I, i'm a real sucker for this kind of a choral stuff I, it was getting me making me think i could make some like really wild magma kind of music with it <laughs> so, uh, um <laughs> magma magma for the win um but uh um but yeah how, oh what amazing really really are amazing company aren't they so i i, I think this is going to probably do very very well for them again um and like you were saying at the top of this and you were saying how it's not like so bombastic and uh it, it, isn't that brilliant though that's the that's the selling point for this isn't it it's just it's, yeah it's well the other incredibly the thing, seductive the thing is that was quite interesting about it i mean they recorded it in all these multiple ways but because mm. there's close there's closer mics as well you get this real level of detail of in the individual voice and that was really highlighted by hearing the people actually singing in a room it was quite right 
it was quite remarkable actually it was sort of felt like wow that's not something you get i wish i wish i wish i wish i'd recorded some of it to play because it i mean it wouldn't have captured it but it sounded right. incredible and they are great great singers so i mean How, it's one of those things that you know you're, you're not going to buy it just for a punt you're probably going to buy it if you need it and if you need it there's have, nothing out that they're like that I have think. they recorded it in surround as well and so can you are they proper oh surround? that's a good question i'm not sure mm. about that i'm not sure i don't think i can answer that um whether or not you'd have to maybe have multiple instances i, I don't know it it uses the they've, they've moved from contact though so it's no it's now in their own engine but they've got their evo grid uh working on this as well so you can randomize a lot of stuff and they recorded an awful lot of really interesting dissonant textures as well which are kind of you know it's just the stuff that human voices i mean there are some keyboards i mean i've just reviewed the uh, key lab which is of uh, 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 which comes with the analog lab which is a, a totally different level of sampling but some of the sounds in there particularly the electromechanical stuff and the, it's the same playing electrical mechanical instrument there are some instruments that you can just sort of lean on the keyboard and play all the notes in the wrong order all at the same time and yet they sound okay you know or not just that's okay, my style really lovely <laughs> yeah. and it's the same with the human uh, voice yeah i was just going to say isn't that brilliant that they've got 60 staff and it's building i had no idea the numbers that they would ship of something like that because it's a niche market it's expensive and it should be expensive because four years and and that amount of work that goes into something like that and i guess if you compare it to getting a choir in it's probably cheaper than one session as well but um it's still that niche that niche thing so so yeah full marks to them if they're growing like that that's fantastic because you, you want guys like that to succeed i think they started out very small didn't they and it's just just growing and growing so i'm very really pleased exactly about that. exactly well i, I, I sorry oh, Gass, can yeah. i just say one more thing Something came out last Friday that is a that sets a new benchmark, a really high watermark, um, and is a computer game called Red Dead Redemption Two, which is oh, a, yes. set in the Wild West kit, set in eighteen ninety nine, and it is in it's a masterpiece. It is an absolute masterpiece, and thoroughly recommended for anyone who may you know, and, and actually thoroughly recommended for people who maybe have stood you know not interested in computer games. The reason why I mentioned in it other than it being like a as a game is amazing the 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 soundtrack is just astonishingly good i think they've used the same composer who worked on the first one but there is a constantly uh adaptive soundtrack uh that goes on uh that responds to what happens within the game and um and it's got a beautiful minimalist approached at many times just sometimes just just using almost just like a kind of floor tom or something and just uh and just occasional uh, and, and everything just reacts so beautifully it's an it's an astonishingly uh it, it's this has taken a lot a long time to make and it really is um uh, yeah it sets a new level but it also this this game industry you know as we know is an enormous industry but just the the scope and for composers to work within is amazing i think this yeah, i was just wanted to mention that really though because every single aspect of this game is perfection really I, yeah, sound, yeah say you, you i mean I, I love to experience it but the thing is is with me i just I, I spend so much time in front of a computer i don't want to spend any more time learning a game or the systems you know because mm. i'm so i'm so disconnected from that i i would be it would take mm. me weeks just to figure out how to kind of move around and get the key combination no, i have not <laughs> i've not got the patience true but i mean it really is like the next i mean i think it's it's beyond film now this is it's better experience than film because yeah. it's got it's got what film can offer and a whole heap more i think and you know there's not many that come out that that you can say that about but this one you absolutely can you know mm. really something well, I'd be else. Love to you really talk need to, to experience about, it i'd love to talk to somebody about uh, um producing mm. sound for game and we d i did have a series plan but it sort of fell by the wayside but maybe i'll pick that up again and see if i can mm. bring all those threads together but i uh, really as for now we should probably think about uh saying goodbye because it's uh it's that time it's past five o'clock which means and it's halloween i've got to get back to to um to get i've got yeah i've got to, to go where to your crypt get back to my crypt. now i've got to get back to uh to, to open the door to the little children you know all oh yes of course all i gotta i gotta get back to to my to my uh my hob where i'm boiling some hot oil that i'm gonna pour over anyone who comes knocking <laughs> oh bless you guys i'm sure Humbug. they'll be looking for Humbug. marshmallow surely would be more appropriate and probably a higher <laughs> okay. a higher boiling temperature as well you know 
<laughs> Maybe. Anyway, well, thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dominic, for stepping in the short notice. You Thanks for having me. In there. It's been a pleasure. Oh, so, thank uh, you. Really uh, good. Yeah, so good luck with uh, with your app programming. I know you've probably I'm just going to go already. and play Red Dead Redemption now. I, the app's over. I'm just going <laughs> to computer it? the games. Then. I haven't, but I've no doubt. The trouble is it just yeah. puts everything back by about three months, doesn't it? But no, after that, I'm going to yeah. have to get it. <laughs> Right. Okay. Yeah, oh well. Thank so you, but thank you very much for joining us. And Gaz, also thanks for joining us. Don't forget, uh, we got a Kita, uh, Axe, Roland Axe uh, uh, coming up at some point in the future. And of course, don't forget oh, well. if you want to come and check out the, if you want to come to the Sonic Live event, Sonic uh, Live, 20, come, 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 twenty fourth of November, Sonic Live in Bristol, DBS Music, uh, Bitly slash Sonic Live eighteen will get you to the ticket site, and they are limited yeah. numbers, so. And they are very book limited. early, folks. They're All more them. limited than we thought they were going to be as well. So it's not yeah. a lot of tickets there. So get the ticket soon because we don't don't be disappointed. Don't leave it till last minute because they'll be gone. Yes, I take that all on board. Anyway, thank you very much. Uh, we uh, we will now uh, say goodbye to everybody. That was Sonic Talk episode uh, five hundred and fifty six. See you next time. Bye bye now. <laughs>